It is very difficult to walk in American cities, and I'm not just talking about issues of the built environment. Law enforcement, the media, and history have been holding us back. So let's descend down the rabbit hole and see how we got here and come up with some hope on the other side. It was only about a hundred years ago when everyone was allowed on the streets. Kids played and people hawked wares right on the road, among other things. The roads are or were the commons, which is a resource shared by all and accessible by all. This was the way of the world for most of the existence of the United States up until the 1920s when car ownership steeply increased along with its most deleterious effect, road deaths. That is when the fight for who is allowed in the road began. Can certain citizens and activists looking to make the roads safer tried to introduce a law that governed the speed at which a car could travel. This mobilized the car manufacturers and the nascent car lobbyist groups to work together and strike down this law, embattling any laws that would limit personal vehicles in the future. From this time forward, the streets were slowly being taken away from everyone outside of their vehicle. A full legal takeover of the roads was done through then Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover, creating uniform laws for states to adopt that make it illegal to be in the road outside of a car. The AAA set up re-education campaigns in schools, feeding young children propaganda that told them that the roads have always belonged to cars. And lastly, the National Automobile Chamber of Commerce lobbying group ran advertising campaigns meant to demean and dehumanize those who wish to use the roads outside of a vehicle. While these may be humorous today, a hundred years of lobbying and advertising has ingrained much of this into our psyche in subtler ways. Design under this anti-pedestrian legal framework worked to reinforce who the roads were stolen from. With the people out of the way, engineers could now design infrastructure for vehicle-only usage. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy that as places became less accessible without a vehicle, that vehicles became more popular and down it went. Till we get to the point where it is nearly impossible to travel to other towns without getting into a vehicle. One would be quite bold to think that they could walk to the hardware store only a mile away. A trip like this would be a high adrenaline death race. There is little to no requirement to retrofit road crossings and sidewalks or to require that new bridges be built with room for those on foot or bike. Pedestrian-specific infrastructure like public staircases or pedestrian bridges are just seen as wastes of money by engineers and politicians who may have never walked to a grocery store in their lives. Sometimes I question if there was any real thought put into these decisions. Like, I guess walking to the next town over is an optional activity? Oh look, I could take a quick 1.5 mile detour. Fun. Maybe I could just scale this cliff faster? The knock-on effects of our built environment are the pedestrian-focused laws. They create a gray area which allow law enforcement to search, ticket, and arrest people for merely existing on the street. Some of the most egregious laws I've seen are the bespoke laws of Massachusetts, which are over a page of if this, do that. I can imagine not a single person in Massachusetts understands these laws at a fundamental level. So let me present to you a scenario. You're an average guy from Boston, driving your car down the road, and there's a person in the crosswalk. What do you do? Well, it says here that... You shall yield the right of way, slowing down or stopping if needed, to a pedestrian in a crosswalk, when they are in your lane or the pedestrian approaches from the other half of the roadway within five feet. So I get to decide if I slow down to yield the right of way? Uh, okay, I guess I can blow through the intersection as long as the person crossing is more than five feet from my lane. Okay, so this law does not precede the previous law. 
Furthermore, you can't hit pedestrians. Oh, and you must sound the horn. Okay, so honk as I blow through the intersection so blind people know I'm there, like a freight train at a grade crossing. Got it. Oh, here's a wall of text. Whenever a totally or partially blind person, no, 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 Kane's dogs, attempts to cross the roadway, the driver of every vehicle approaching um, must come to a full stop. Okay, so if the person who is crossing is blind, we need to stop no matter what, but there's no requirement for blind people to identify as blind. That would be an undue restriction on their rights. So everyone on the road just needs to guess if a person is blind or not while approaching an intersection. You know what? I'm just going to do whatever I want and hope I don't get stopped. And this is just covering vehicle to pedestrian interactions in the rare few places where people are allowed to cross. In Massachusetts, the number of places where it is legal to cross already is limited within 300 feet of a marked crosswalk only. So on a long block, you would need to go all the way to the end of the block just to cross even if there is no traffic. Even worse, Massachusetts is looking to increase its fine for crossing outside of a crosswalk even today. And did I mention that you could be ticketed for crossing in a crosswalk? Here's a little taste. If there is a big button on the crosswalk, you must hit it and you must wait for the pedestrian signal to change or be subjected to a jaywalking fine. Or this one, it is illegal to hail a cab from within the crosswalk, the only place where it is somewhat safe to stand on the road. I've been to plenty of intersections where the beg button has not worked, so a person walking would be forced to break the law. Gray areas like this exist in most places with a notable exception, which I'll talk about near the end of the video. Now trying to forget the absurdity of the laws, what happens after there's an accident? Law enforcement comes in, gets to work assigning blame to either the person who was struck or the person who had struck them. A small checklist of variables present at the time of the crash will guide the officer to a conclusion so the insurance companies can start exchanging money between both parties. But this ignores the third party, the design or designers of the road, which ensures that we will never get good data on what attributes of the road design are making it unsafe. After all that is said and done, the police have finished their reports, the car is taken to the repair shop, and the other party is taken to the hospital or morgue, comes the press. Law enforcement will get out in front of the press and editorialize the crash. Bringing forward their reports with flawed methodologies on which party is to blame for the crash. These reports then get played over and over again on the local news. Using language that either places traffic violence as either a blameless accident or ascribing blame to just one party. Here is an example of an offending headline. Pedestrian struck in Midtown Manhattan during protests. One seriously hurt. Struck by whom? What? A man with a baseball bat? This is an example of placing victims front and center without a perpetrator. Which you can only find out if you open the article. Pedestrian fatally struck by a state police officer on NJ Roadway. Now this includes the other party in the crash, but also refers to the perpetrator as state police vehicle, when we know vehicles don't drive themselves. Asterisk. NYC cyclist deaths. Woman wearing helmet while riding a bicycle struck and killed in Chelsea. Here's a different one. This one lays out the protective gear that the person on the bike was wearing, right in the headline. The idea being that this crash is egregious simply because the victim was wearing protective gear, not because they were struck in the first place. I don't see what type of protective gear the driver had on their front bumper in the headline. Now let's have a little fun. Let's see how the same news agency reports a death involving a bike rider and a person on foot. E-bike crash that kills a Queenswoman sparks calls to add more safety measures to protect pedestrians on NYC streets. Cars killing pedestrians don't seem to ever spark any of this outrage, at least according to the news headlines. All is not lost though. There are ways forward. From the legal side, there is an excellent example of a proper pedestrian law. One without ambiguity and the inspiration for this whole video. 
The great state of New Jersey's stop for pedestrian law. No need to break out a flowchart to see who goes when. If all you know is that you need to stop for a pedestrian in a crosswalk, then you know the law in its totality. With a small amount of education and enforcement, it has made New Jersey a much nicer place to walk. This should be the uniform code in all 50 states. Making sure that each accident of a vehicle crashing into a pedestrian is reported is a good first step in our crash reporting system. In a City Lab report done on Washington, D.C., it found as much as 30% of 911 calls about drivers striking pedestrians, cyclists, or other road users were not even reported in certain neighborhoods. And by changing the way road violence is reported by the police, we can begin to fix the actual problems with the infrastructure by labeling designs as unsafe, not only the drivers. This is what is done in the Netherlands. Every crash is an opportunity to reevaluate the design of a road and continually improve. This is why their own versions of the Vision Zero program get so much closer to accomplishing their goals every single year. For more on the topic of fixing crash reporting, check out the Streets blog article linked below. As for media reporting, there's a long way to go with the education on how to report traffic violence, but the information on how to best do so already exists. A report done by four researchers from Rutgers University, Texas A&M, and Lyme Mobility break down how only a few words can change how the public views a crash. Look at this first sentence. Witnesses tell police the victim was struck, can be improved by adding by the driver to the sentence. Applying agency to the perpetrator of the crash can reduce victim blaming. Or with this last example, one of the riders was hit by a vehicle that was turning left, could be changed to a vehicle that was turning left hit one of the riders. Changing the focus from the victim to the perpetrator. The focus of the title of a story about a crash is generally seen as the party who is most blameworthy. Getting people to want to walk and treating them as equal citizens when they do so is important and we have a long road ahead. If you like this video, please subscribe and check out my other videos linked here. I also have a Ko-fi page where you can contribute to me making this content. Goodbye for now.